Good evening uh, and uh, good morning and good afternoon wherever you are in the world today and welcome to today's event. This is brought to you by the volunteers of the IET in Surrey and um, I'm going to be your host for this evening so uh, my name is Nigel Ward and uh, I'll be guiding you through today's presentation and the Q&A which will follow. Um, Today we have a very interesting uh, topic to, to look at, which is a combination of looking back at history and also looking forward at the lessons that we can learn uh, from that. And uh, I shall introduce in a moment our uh, speaker today, who's uh, Dr. Jonathan Aylen. So uh, today's topic then, um, the, uh, the topic of the, the talk is Cold War uh, to coal trains. Now that's quite a mouthful to, uh, to I, I, I'm going to blame Jonathan for that, uh, for making a tongue twister for us to start off with, and I'll be testing him on it later. Now, now Jonathan is the president of the New Newcomen Society and also an honorary senior research fellow at the Manchester Business School. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the Newcomen Society is the International Society for the History of Engineering and Technology, and it takes its name from Thomas Newcomen, who invented the first practical working steam engine around 1712. Um, now, as far as the society is concerned, 2020 is its centenary year, um, although the celebrations that they had planned haven't quite worked out uh, for all the reasons that you might guess. Jonathan's uh, enjoyed an unusual career as an economist, an engineer and also an innovation researcher. He's published and advised on climate change and on environmental management. But the subject of today's talk, let me see if I can get it right again, Cold War to Coal Trains, is uh, the story of TOPS, which is the British Railway's first computer train operating system. That's where TOPS comes from, the acronym uh, train operating system. And so we're going to be looking at how adoption of new IT systems can help transform the management and organization of a business and move it from reliance on custom and practice to modern information control. And uh, I'm reliably told Jonathan says he hopes to upset your preconceptions about British Rail as a business. So we'll, we'll find that out in a few moments. And just to note that um, uh, Jonathan has been working on this particular project uh, with Bob Gwynn of the National Railway uh, Museum. So thanks uh, also to him as well. So without further ado, um, I'd like to hand over to Jonathan now and uh, we'll hear all about Cold War to Coal Trains. There we are, I got it right. Okay, this very surprising story is very much joint work with Bob Gwynn from the National Railway Museum. Uh, Bob is my partner in crime in this and I believe watching, listening in tonight, but... Uh, I could do with some help answering some questions later on, Bob. Bob first approached me for help on computer history because the Railway Museum had received 18 unopened boxes of material covering the introduction of something called the Total Operations and Processing System at British Rail during the 1970s. And what's not to like about 18 unopened archive boxes? Now, I come here and talk to you in all humility because IET members know a great deal more about computing and telecoms than I do. But at least I have some background knowledge in computing, going back to an ICL 1904 with a George operating system, which was introduced to our then, my then university at the, the, at the same time as TOPS. What is scary is that you probably know a great deal more about trains than I do, so my apologies if there are some lapses of technical detail. I did in work, indeed work for British Rail uh, for a while, but as a, as, a, as a merchant seaman. What I want to stress today is that what unfolded from these boxes and a range of oral history interviews was a complete secret story. It is un, it, and what I hope to unfold to you is an advance, is a story of advanced telecommunications and cutting edge real time computer systems 
which, as Nigel said, I hope will make you see British Rail in a completely new light. We'll see how TOPS helped British Rail make the transition from a craft-based railway relying on custom and practice to a computer-controlled system relying on modern management practice and carefully planned routines. And we'll also trace the origins of this control revolution, how the railways always had a problem controlling the system, and bizarrely, how British Rail freight traffic came to rely on Cold War defence procurement, an early warning system from the United States. The idea that it was a secret history comes from what Bob would call a Grice's website. This uh, glorious comment is from James, a former railway man living in Beverly, that's all we know, on uh, just one, a model railway community. And he rightly said, things like tops form an almost secret railway history, which most people will never hear. But why the secrecy? Why do we not know about British Rail as a modern management organisation? Why do we not know about British Rail as an international computer pioneer? Why do we think of it in terms of steam and nostalgia? And the truth is the story of technical advance at British Railways has always been obscured by an obsession with steam and nostalgia. This is the famous Flying Scotsman at York Railway Museum when it returned from restoration here in Bury in, in 2016. You can see the crowds that it attracted. And that love of preserved railways, that love of steam locomotives, the love of Santa specials, has in a sense drowned out the true story of British Rail as a modern organisation trying desperately to modernise and adopt new technology in the 1960s and 1970s. I could give you lots of examples of British Rail embracing the white heat of technology to uh, misquote uh, Harold Wilson uh, from the 1960s, but I've picked just two here. I could, of course, have picked railway stations. I could have picked uh, the modern livery, the wonderful lettering that was adopted, the new name, British Rail, which was adopted in 1965. But I've picked just two. The first one is the advanced passenger train seen here in 1973. And you will, of course, say that it didn't run. The high speed train instead took over. But this represents a, a huge paradigm change in rail technology because for the first time, British Rail, led by Alan Wickens, understood how the rail uh, wheel interface worked and were able to model that on computers, a breakthrough that made high speed trains possible throughout the world. So that was certainly as cutting edge and as revolutionary technology as you could get. But you can also see here British Rail trying to ape the success of the airlines. These smart trolley dollies or um, uh, hovercraft hostesses as they really were, are probably at the naming ceremony for Princess Anne because Princess Margaret actually started the cross-channel SRN4 car carrying hovercraft service from, uh, from Dover to France in 1968. Again, an attempt to, to, to use new technology and to learn lessons from other then fast growing and and more successful sectors. So forget the image of British Rail as an old fashioned organization. As it was, it was desperate to shed steam and it was desperate to adopt a modern approach to livery, uniforms, technology, stations. The stumbling block was rail freight. Alan Wickens described this in, in one of our oral history interviews as essentially a Victorian system. And what you can see here is a poor chap uh, working in a shunting yard at Tinsley in, in, in South Yorkshire, not, not, far from, uh, not far from Sheffield. But notice lots of features, the, 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 the wagons there where he's read, trying desperately to read the wagon label. Not too hard a task on a sunny day like this with, with nice warmth and shadows, but uh, pretty impossible on a dark night when most freight moved and very difficult in snow and fog and rain. Uh, 
Um, he's trying to read a wagon label on a wagon that essentially just has nothing more than a parking brake. You can see the parking brake stretching there. These unfitted freight trains carried mixed goods from shunting yard to shunting yard, essentially relying on the skill of the loco driver and the guardsman working in tandem to, to control the braking. And the cargoes they carried in these mixed uh, wagons uh, set off and essentially the customer had no idea where their freight was going or where it was likely to end up or when it would arrive or how it would get through the convoluted system, often taking weeks to get actually quite short journeys from shunting yard to shunting yard to final destination. So essentially a Victorian system desperately in need of reform. It had many other problems too. The regular regional traffic circ circulars that were sent out often had pleas for missing wagons. And this is just the first one we happen to come across. Locomotive stores van 7558 is missing and is required at crew works. If found, please telex and so on. Locomotive stores works are missing from Gateshead Derby circuit. Please, please again telex crew for instructions. So there were regular surveys on Sunday nights to find missing brake vans. And there's a lovely shaggy dog story told about two bullion wagons going missing near permanently in an Edinburgh siding. And when the uh, local railway men were asked why it hadn't been broken into, they of course said, well, because it wasn't whiskey. But that apocryphal story highlights the somewhat chaotic nature of, of rail travel as, as British Rail uh, entered the 1970s. British Rail, of course, faced growing competition from the roads. You'll recognise this modernized, modernist structure, some of you from the, your trips up to the Lake District, it's uh, near, near Lancaster on the M6. Uh, but that highlights the fact that the first motorway in Britain, the so-called Preston Bypass, opened up in uh, December 1958. It shut soon afterwards because of civil engineering problems, but essentially the motorway revolution had begun and very rapidly by 1970, the motorway network was beginning to approach a thousand miles, certainly 800 miles. So now lorries were becoming more reliable and you could consign your freight by motorway from origin to destination without unloading or reloading. And you would actually be able to, you would actually know where your freight consignment was when the lorry turned up. Uh, Cecil Paget, who's the son of the chairman of Midland Railways, took it upon himself to find out what was going wrong with his freight trains and parked the director's coach at Masborough in South Yorkshire next to a marshalling yard to actually see for himself. It's said that he even cooked for himself. And what he did was notice the fact that these poor coal trains stood in the siding all day without going anywhere until there was a change of crew or indeed till they needed more uh, coal for the locos. The point was that the rail system was in the hands of the signalers. The signalers had control and gave priority to through trains and, uh, and express trains. And so the poor freight trains never got a look in. So he established this freight control system, which has many of the modern elements of a modern freight control system. Uh, for example, you can see the way in which trains uh, are, are tracked using telephones and the way in which trains progress across a map using uh, cards to keep track of them. So the railways were always conscious of the need to control their system. And this had been true since the origins of the railway. There was a long tradition of control and monitoring because of the need to ensure access to the track and because um, for, uh, for, for safety purposes. So John Liffin said, for example, from the Science Museum, that the railway telegraph, which is in regular use from uh, on the Blackwall Railway from about 1839, was the first practical use of electricity. And certainly the railways were very early to adopt Hollerith cards, uh, uh, for instance, as early as 1905, here at Man in Manchester at Hunts Bank, uh, 
the Liverpool and Yorkshire Railway were the first to use, uh, uh, the second company in the UK to use ho uh, Hollerith machines. And they were also, and this will come as a surprise to many of you, pioneers in the use of computing. This is one uh, promotional photo of a glorious institution, uh, British Rail Eastern Region of Peterborough, where they, uh, they had a, a computer for funds and pensions. But they also used computers very widely for applications such as payroll to cope with things like the complicated, um, uh, complicated overtiming. And, uh, uh, and they had Burroughs machines, IBM machines and ICT machines all uh, at uh, key computer centres, Crew, Reading, uh, Darlington and so on. They also experimented very widely, and if there were more time, we could talk about this, for instance, with Ferranti computers for timetabling, Elliott computers for signalling, and so on. So computers were us when it came to British Rail, and this leads us on to their attempt to use computers to control the whole of the British Rail freight network. TOPS is British Rail's first nationwide computer-based train operating system. TOPS stands for Total Operations and Processing System. And I hope to unravel the history and the impact of that from now on. Of course, in the cynical jokes of um, the railways, it was also sometimes known as bottoms when it failed, back onto the old manual system. I learned that joke from uh, David Elliott, who is a computer designer, uh, sorry, a steam engine uh, designer. You may not think that we still build steam uh, locomotives, but uh, David Elliott is one uh, working up in uh, Darlington using CAD CAM, you'll be reassured. Uh, he first told me that joke, having heard it in, in Leeds. So TOPS was an attempt to keep track of every single freight train, every loco that was hauling them, every wagon and every cargo and their movements across the whole of the British Rail network in real time through a centralised computer system from 1975 onwards. So this stretched from uh, John O'Groats in Scotland right down to the China Clay district near Land's End and right across to the train ferry terminals of Dover and Harwich. And for the very first time, British Rail knew where its assets were. Let's give me, uh, let me give you an introduction to TOPS. British Rail has recently introduced a computer-based system with an immense storage capacity which provides the means to control the many thousands of freight wagons and locomotives as they move about over the whole of Britain. The object is to improve maintenance, to save money and increase efficiency through a greatly intensified use of wagons and locos. Notice that uh, British Rail didn't worry, public relations department uh, weren't involved in that film because they wouldn't have used such battered wagons, surely. <laughs> OK, British Rail soon realised that they couldn't develop a system wide, nationwide computer system off their own bat. This would take far too long to realise and be far too costly. So what they did was to go on a, um, a, a jolly a set of jollies, sorry, a set of um, uh, fact finding missions around the world, looking at other people's computer systems. They went to Germany and the Kinetic Island experiment. They went to the Netherlands. They went to Japan um, and they went to France uh, all over the world and were very impressed by a system being developed in Canada by Canadian National. Who were relying very extensively on Southern Pacific of the United States. Southern Pacific had started their work on computer control of freight trains as early as 1960 in collaboration with IBM. Southern Pacific, I should explain, is very much a, a typical American railroad that boasts that they go from uh, Washington to Washington, from uh, Washington State up on the northern northwestern seaboard, 
all the way down through California, through Los, Los Angeles, New Mexico, right across to Washington DC on the, uh, on the East Coast. A very long mileage of track, 14,000 miles. Um, uh, you may puzzle as to why they only had 1,000 or so crew and 2,000 locos. That's because, of course, many trains were double-headed. And they operated out of a base in San Francisco uh, and were developing a computer-based system as a joint venture with IBM. Now, of course, that begs the question, why should IBM have an interest in controlling freight trains? What led IBM to be interested in selling a system-wide uh, wagon control system to what would, uh, other, most people would casually regard as a relatively backward industrial sector? Here we have to ask, where did IBM learn its computing? Well, that's beautifully summarized by uh, Paul Edwards' book on, on um, uh, the strategic semi-automatic ground environment, SAGE, that Paul Edwards' book, The Closed World, World, he said for two decades from the early 1940s until the early 1960s, the armed forces of the United States were the single most important driver of digital com computer development. And that is not an understatement. He was not exaggerating. For instance, IBM Military Products Division supplied 56 uh, computers for the, this uh, uh, American Early Warning System, SAGE, worth a half a billion dollars, not in current prices, half a billion dollars in 1950s prices. So this was a huge, uh, a gigantic commitment on the part of the US Defense Department. And this is where IBM learned the crucial skill of interaction between mainframe computers and telecoms. Let me explain SAGE, let me explain the semi-automatic ground environment. Essentially SAGE was a real-time computer system which brought in information from airborne early warning aircraft, from picket ships, from the famous Texas towers off the east coast from uh, land-based radar up in Canada and Alaska, as well as across the northern United States, and interpreted all this air traffic control data in order to look for incoming Russian bombers intent upon um, a, a first strike, a, a nuclear strike on the United States. And then they would, in turn, it being a uh, constant touch with either uh, anti-aircraft uh, uh, batteries or guided missile systems like a Nike or Bomark and uh, interceptor aircraft. So it was, if you like, an attempt to automate warfare, a post-war attempt to automate warfare based around centralized computer systems. Of course, this is not a new story. Uh, in the Second World War, the chain home radar defences of the UK were up and running in time for the Battle of Britain. And this worked, of course, by observers and, and radio uh, radar operators, or radio if you like, uh, uh, interpreting signals on a screen, on a goniometer, and transmitting by telephone to central headquarters uh, what they could see of incoming aircraft. In turn, the central headquarters would interpret the data and lay on uh, fighters, interceptors, spitfires and hurricanes predominantly to, to attack the incoming um, uh, uh, German aircraft. That was an incredibly labor intensive system. And also it was a very slow system. Well, of course, come the jet age when planes move much faster, some kind of automation, some kind of computer control was needed to cut the time delays in early warning systems. So IBM was very heavily involved uh, in uh, teleprocessing with SAGE. If you want some measure of just how gigantic this early warning system was, 
At the time, by the late 1950s, Sage employed half, that's not a typo, half the software programmers in America. IBM wouldn't employ them because they couldn't, didn't know what they would do with all those programmers when the project was complete. They were actually employed by um, a government organization. But uh, it spawned a, a staggering range of computing innovations, which we uh, don't want to go into here, but uh, are fascinating in their own right. And above all, it taught IBM both to manufacture computers in bulk and things like ferrite core memories, and to work computer telecoms interfaces. Now, needless to say, in the nature of military um, uh, technology in the post-war world, it soon became obsolete as ICBMs arrived uh, uh, instead of aircraft. And IBM looked for a way of commercializing this newfound knowledge in the early 1960s, they look for ways of commercializing this newfound knowledge, brand, giving it a brand name, teleprocessing, and looked around for customers. As I suggested, they went into a joint venture with Southern Pacific, and over the period of 1960 to uh, late, late uh, 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 just before 1970, Southern Pacific and IBM working together managed to get this commercial version of an early warning system, TOPS, to work successfully across the Southern Pacific network. British Rail scoured the world, went off to San Francisco and negotiated with the TOPS consortium to buy TOPS for British Rail. Now just think about it, and this is one of the better parts of oral history. These British Rail managers were turning up in San Francisco, at the height of flower power, the um, uh, 1969, at the, uh, at the height of the hippie uh, movement. Uh, I, can, I can imagine that they hugely enjoyed this purchasing expedition. But apart from the enjoyment, they also managed to uh, uh, agree to buy uh, the, whole, uh, the whole system for adoption on British Rail. Now this was going to be extremely radical. The first point was that this was going to lead British Rail were going to be forced for the very first time to actually establish what their assets were. They would have to list their entire wagon fleet of a third of a million or so. They had to distribute this right around the country. So they had something like 155 different terminals linked to the mainframe computers in London. And they had to monitor up to 4,500 freight trains a day, all in real time. But as they said, once it had happened, no longer does anything arrive like a bolt from the blue. It was, of course, an early warning system, not for aircraft, but for freight trains. The whole setup was centralized on a rather bland, appropriately, building in Melbury Terrace next to Marleybone Station in London, the HQ of the top system, a three-story building called Blamford House. All data processing was centralized there. And of course it worked in real time. So there were always two mainframes at work, one live and one backup. And at one stage, even a third when the cutover was at its peak, uh, which they later sold on for a profit. So the ground floor that you can see here was communications. It was like a huge signaling system but for the telephone network of British Rail. The first floor was taken up, as we'll see, with the computers and the disk memories, and the top floor was handed over to the software programmers. And as one of our respondents said, Bruce McDougall, this, this was space age for its day. So on the first floor were, um, essentially it was of course massive, massive scale data handling, massive scale file handling, because what you're doing is forever updating files 
relating to where trains were, where wagons were, and how they were moving across the system. And this was largely done by these uh, uh, disk store memories, like huge graphone disks, uh, 32 in total, masses and masses of filing cabinets full of gramophone disks for memory. And it was cutting edge. For instance, they had uh, visual display units for handling inquiries. Although, again, this PR photo is a foul up because it's not even plugged in. If you examine it closely, you can see under the desk, the plug is not even in. And so it's not switched on. So poor old Kath um, uh, was just posing for a photo. She wasn't working that particular uh, moment. Out in the field was somewhat different. Because remember, they had to get information in from all the distributed um, uh, all the distributed sidings and marshalling yards throughout the length and breadth of, of Great Britain, from England, Wales, and Scotland. And here, area freight centres were set up, which in at least half the cases were installed in porter cabins out on remote marshalling yards. Um, uh, the other half used existing buildings next to, next to freight yards. So York on construction of York uh, did rather well out of this contract, uh, supplying these luxury, these luxury porter cabins with, with toilets uh, and, and a baby belling cooker. That's essential. So these area freight centres or tops offices were linked into the local area using something really very novel for uh, the early 1970s, fax machines. They had two Muir head fax machines, one for faxes going out uh, and one for faxes coming in. And then they had terminals that were data linked permanently to uh, Marleybone so that they could update uh, the central computers at the uh, Blamford House on, on what was happening uh, to, to each individual train and every single wagon. And these places were manned by young men, most nearly all young men, well paid because they got lots of overtime. Remember that freight trains move at night. Uh, so these were uh, sort of little havens at night time. Uh, and uh, these tox clerks were uh, could see that the modern computer technology was a great way to get um, was a great way to get promotion and um, uh, uh, and get a pay rise for adopting uh, uh, new skills. That, and uh, as I said, there was always a baby belling and always tea on the baby belling. And I had a marvelous interview with a um, maintenance engineer who looked after the computer terminals in the, uh, who was on 24 hour call out looking after the computer terminals at these area freight centers. And he said to me graphically, I tell you what, you have a cup of tea from that at three o'clock in the morning, you could literally feel the tartar out of the tea etching into your teeth. It woke you up. <laughs> Just catches what it was like in a busy area freight centre in the middle of the night and a remote sidings with the electric heaters on against the cold and perhaps the local rail gang coming in to uh, have some of that formidable tea. Associated with this was a whole host of uh, fascinating ephemera. For example, uh, there's this reminder sheet here, which uh, are on the total operations processing system, where you could write on the back, no matter what the weather, with, with a China graph pencil, with a, with a crayon pencil. Uh, even if it was pouring with rain, you could write wagon numbers on the back. And the curious thing is that these Ventec terminals worked with a different size of computer card. You're all used, for those of a certain age, are used to 80 column standard computer cards, but these were 96 columns in three rows, able to pack in more information so that you could get a, a complete, for instance, locomotive listing onto one card. Of course, this whole system was written in uh, American software. And as Ken Green, one of the early managers who uh, bought and developed the system for British Rail said, Americans don't speak English and we don't speak American. <laughs>
And I must say, when I first started working on this and, and uh, cataloging the archive, I became truly puzzled by some of the language that was being used. Consist, that's easier, a train consisting of. Stanox, well that's station number X, uh, still in use incidentally on British Rail e even today. And cabs tour is really not easy to understand unless you realise that a cab is at a shortage for American brake van, it's called a caboose. So cabs tour summarises all the brake vans in, in an area. So this computer language, uh, uh, actually much of it came into use on, on British Rail. Let me show you how it worked with this film, uh, which describes it beautifully. When, for example, a train is marshalled, its consist is made up as a pack of cards. Put into the card reader with appropriate instructions, it prints out a train list. And then the processor calculates the length and weight of the train, available brake force and permitted speed. On departure, the train list becomes the consist and it is sent via the central computer where the files are updated and the consist immediately retransmitted to the train's destination, where it will arrive long before the train does. OK, so that illustrates the central point that every train was mimicked by a set of cards. Each, uh, e each, each um, loco, each brake van and all the intermediate wagons, each one had a card and uh, th they could be fed straight into the computer so that the central computer could be updated and then as you've heard uh, the information could be transmitted on to the next destination. Now, it's interesting that that actually um, that film was made at, uh, at Shunting Yard in East London where the first porter cabin was blown over by a gale as soon as it was delivered and they had to deliver a second one so it wasn't without its hazards. Now, what resulted from that, of course, is uh, a, a computer printout of every train that was available uh, uh, to, to, to those who wanted it, uh, which would give you the complete uh, train consist. And when you look at one of these computer printouts, uh, classic sort of uh, holes on either side of the paper for the to, to, to drive the, uh, the, so the ratchets on the edge of the printer would drive the paper, it looks totally incomprehensible. Of course, you need to know the jargon and you can spend a very entertaining evening accompanied by malt whiskey trying to interpret what each one says. So, for example, this one that I just picked out of the archives at York um, gives a consist of a, a train which started at, uh, uh, at the train responsibility area Bescott, which is near Birmingham, of course. Next stop was going to be York. Uh, towed by a Type 25 diesel and all, if you looked up um, that you'd find all the details of that particular diesel loco and the number of wagons on it you can see quite clearly it was six at least two of those are private it tells you what type of wagon whether they're low loaders or uh, car wagons uh, it tells you the total length of the train uh, that the the next yard it's going to which is York Dringhouses south of York uh, the final stop, which is Gateshead Car Export Depot, and it tells you all about the cargo and it even asks you to ring up the people that can sign the cargo to tell them when the train has arrived. And since that's a continuously air brake train, the maximum speed of the train is 75 miles an hour. So you can see this was a, a, a way of providing constant and real time intelligence on, on, on all the train movements. But of course, this wasn't simple and straightforward. Uh, there were many obstacles to adoption. Uh, for a start, the British government favoured a national champion, ICL, as it then was. It can't last, as they call it sometimes, uh, as a computer supplier. And so they had to stage a sort of um, uh, a beauty parade to see whether ICL could actually bid against IBM, but they couldn't. They had no hope of producing either adequate hardware or, or developing the software in time. 
There's also an added problem that BR was frankly a lot more complex than, than Southern Pacific. And that's well shown by this comparison here. You can see where well, they have similar route miles uh, uh, because of the way that places like Los Angeles are, are laid out. They even have more sidings in, in America. Uh, but of course, the key difference is they had almost nine times as many daily trains running in the UK as compared to the US and something like um, uh, four times as many wagons, although the number of wagons was never precisely measured. One great advantage is that British Rail, as I said, was a very modern organisation and had actually laid down its own telecoms network, its own coaxial cable network in the 1960s. And here the great breakthrough that many members of IET will recognize is the fact that this cable network meant for voice calls originally could carry a great deal more data if it used multiplexing. So frequency division multiplexing uh, was used in those days, um, uh, which meant that up to eight slow data signals could all be carried down one uh, speech phone line, in fact, even 16, but let's not go into that. And this was all circuit switched through modems because, of course, the, the, the data typed in at the computer terminal at the area freight centers was digital. The telephone transmission was analog and it then had to be demuxed down at Blanford House into a digital form that, 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 that IBM, the IBM computers could use. Um, this represented a complete change in management and approach at British Rail. Because what it meant was, what Bob Wynn said, called it, it meant that they had to develop what Bob Wynn Bob Gwynn calls a doomsday book for British Rail. They had to establish their assets. This was fairly novel. They didn't know how many wagons they had to the nearest uh, uh, 50,000. And TOPS had, had a code for absolutely everything to everywhere. The commodities carried, the locations that they left and, and went to, and every wagon had a unique label. I won't go into commodity codes, uh, but just to say that sensitive cargoes did not have commodity codes. Drink, gold bullion, weapons at the time of the IRA, or radioactive materials tend to be concealed with a, with a rather bland code, unidentified 480, which meant was a euphemism for something, uh, something of interest uh, going through the, the, the system. But all trains ran with TOPS codes, except during the Falklands War, but that's another story. All wagons had to be labelled, and that included, for instance, privately owned wagons, which were often just numbered, for instance, by Associated Portland Cement, one, two, three, four. They all had a letter and six numbers, as you can see here on this uh, coal wagon, uh, a very prominent uh, uh, numbering on the side. But this didn't always work as you might expect. So for instance, Richard Siddle um, wrote in, he worked at the Mansfield concentration sidings, uh, which was an extremely busy uh, coal depot taking in thousands of wagons a day on the Derbyshire Nottinghamshire border. And as he said, we did have a tug of war over ownership from time to time. He recalled one coal wagon disputed with Fife in Scotland they both had the same number on the side. And another problem too was that the uh, numbers would be painted on the side, the guys would then go off for lunch and carry on painting the numbers on the other side, but of course there'd be two different numbers. So re uh, 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 trains regularly left the depot with one wagon on and mysteriously turned up with a different one at their destination. The hardware was advanced for its time, as I said, two IBM 370s with a massive four megabytes of memory, <laughs> which is just laughable now. Um, the IBM card readers didn't last long in the face of uh, dusty, dusty sidings full of uh, coal dust. And very soon these, uh, these Ventec mini computers, Unidata 9, uh, 9200, terminals were used instead with very simple visual display screens. On the top floor at Blamford House, 
uh, the coding was done both to develop tops and to convert it from American to English. All the dates had to be converted and so on. And there were different measurement units. Uh, and uh, one of the glories of oral history is you get to meet people like Margaret Wilmot, who's shown here as a young University of Kent graduate, trained up as a computer programmer at the Grove by British Rail, and then sent to TOPS to do develop a wagon inquiry software. And you can see here, for instance, an in-service training course with uh, Margaret uh, uh, in, in a miniskirt outside uh, an adjacent building and, uh, at Marleybone uh, uh, on a course uh, taught by uh, people from TOPS in San Francisco. The whole system had to be implemented and was essentially cut over um, area by area. Cut over is another American word. Uh, starting with the China Clay District as a pilot study in August 73 and then rolled out on schedule, helped by training crews that quite appropriately traveled around in training trains. And it was then uh, uh, rolled out over a two year period and were inaugurated nationwide by 1975. So let's try and put tops in perspective as we come to an end. It was one of the first nationwide non-military telecoms networks for the flow of information between computers. There were military microwave networks, there was the GPO, but essentially this was one of the very first major nationwide networks in the UK. It ran on IBM middleware that we could talk about um, at great length. Uh, but this is now in use as when you go to a, a bank machine, uh, IBM Kix is now used for commercial transfers between machines. Uh, so it survives in the most unlikely places outside the railways. Let me just show you a, a last film. British Rail now has a highly developed control system operated by the latest data processing equipment interconnected through the railway's own trunk telephone and cable network. The whole forms one of the most technically advanced and effective railway projects in the world today. Notice this was sponsored by the equipment suppliers. Um, okay, what was the impact of TOPS? Well, the irony is, as Margaret Wilmot said, it only served to stem the decline because the bottom was falling out of the freight market due to lorry competition as it went live. So this is a, a lovely picture of uh, overgrown sidings in Gould Docks, which just about sum up the fate of wagon load traffic. But what it did do was transform British Rail from a craft-based custom and practice railway system to proper management mechanism. It moved from custom and practice to standard routines, and by helping identify the costs of modern business, it opened the way to privatization. And remarkably, it is still in use today. Okay, I'd like to acknowledge a great deal of help from my uh, respondents and my research uh, colleague. Um, and if you have any information, we dearly love to hear from you either at Manchester or at the Railway Museum. Okay, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan. That was uh, a tour de force on uh, the, uh, the history of the, the top system. Um, uh, again, I apologize to everyone who's um, tuned in for the, uh, the, the quality of the slides and the videos. Didn't quite work out uh, as we'd planned. Believe it or not, uh, uh, just around seven o'clock this evening, our time, uh, we did a, a full rehearsal and everything was perfect. So um, there we are. Um, what we'll try and do is see if we can make the, uh, the slides available so you can uh, review those afterwards, if, if that's okay, Jonathan. Yeah, sure. Um, so we've uh, got some time for questions now, and um, uh, we're going to be taking questions uh, from members of the audience who've submitted by the uh, Zoom Q&A facility. Uh, 
if you if you have any questions and you you think of anything as the discussion goes on, then there's still time to to pop those in. Um, the questions are going to be fielded um, by our question team, which is uh, Richard, uh, Michael, and Samantha. And uh, if your question isn't asked uh, precisely in the way that you worded it, it's probably because several people are something very similar. So um, uh, our, our expert question wranglers will uh, will put those into a summary question that I hope you'll get the the answer to the point that you wanted to know. So. Um, Richard, do you, do you have a question to, to kick us off? Yes, thanks, Nigel. Yes, I've got a question here from uh, Steve Bissell, uh, who says, my understanding is that TOPS saved a very large number of wagons, uh, cost saving of which must have gone a long way towards the, uh, the overall cost of the scheme itself. Uh, do you have any estimate of how much money was saved by knowing where the wagons were? I, I don't. I, um, I have done some work on the costing, but time prevented uh, prevented me going into that uh, how much it cost and what the benefits were but what I will do is tell you a shaggy dog story thanks to tops we now have all these preserved railways because tops freed up so many wagons that went to the scrap yard that of course the scrap dealers at places like Barry broke up the wagons the surplus wagons in preference to those difficult and hard to handle steam locomotives so the constant supply of scrap from old coal wagons and condemned wagons of all sorts kept them busy and meant that the steam locos rotted away gently in the sidings untouched by the scrapman's torch so when the preservation movement began to get underway in the 70s, there was a ready supply of steam locomotives to be had at places like Barry because they were too difficult to scrap and weren't worth the effort when you had the, uh, when you had the, uh, uh, the gift of all these uh, former coal wagons, for instance. So ironically, TOPS, the preserved railway system, owes its existence to the liberation of all these wagons. Great, thank you. Um, we've got a, another question here from, from Doug, who's asking, uh, how did British Rail determine the location of a wagon and how did they connect this to the computer? Ah, uh, the answer is that they would, go as, a, as an area cut over, which if you remember was the jargon for rolling out tops across across Britain. It didn't go as uniformly as you might expect because they, they left Wales till later because of uh, public relations reasons. They would turn out all the middle managers on nights to note down all the wagons in their district and put them on the computer. So in that way they built up a rolling doomsday book as they covered the country. And of course, what they expected was that they would find hundreds of thousands of wagons in the north of Scotland when they eventually reached there, because there were many that were unaccounted for. They also had all sorts of other sources, uh, I'm told. But I had an excellent interview in Derby where he told me that they used to dig out old books full of wagon purchases and things like that and put those onto the computer. Uh, to try and build up a complete inventory of this third of a million or so wagons uh, that they had to list. It was a monumental task and all British Rail management was involved from time to time. Great. Thank you. It sounds from, uh, from what you, um, you say that much of your uh, research has been done by interviewing people. Is, is that how you, you get most of your, uh, your information or is it, is it trawling through? boxes and boxes of documents well the first initiation was was uh, i rather foolishly offered to catalogue these 18 boxes and you ha might have some idea of a polite small uh, cardboard archive box they're basically coffin sized boxes in which documents have been dumped <laughs> and, and, and so I rather absurdly and rashly agreed to list these. If anyone wants the listing, I, I've forgotten how many words it is, but uh, it, it's, it's the size of a book. So that taught me a great deal. It taught me a great deal. Uh, and I was able to look at the computer printouts 
and learn about the IBM macros and read all the official reports on what, what they bought and what they'd sold and how much a porter cabin cost. But ultimately, the best source that I've discovered, and I've done quite a lot of history of technology work now, for instance, on, uh, on nuclear weapons and on guided missiles, a lot of the best stories and the best insights are to be had from oral history, from the people who were there. And their recall is very impressive, and they often have additional documents. For example, uh, from interviews, you find all sorts of things that people have kept, like tops bags that were handed out to uh, handed out to the to the shunters, uh, computer printout that is somehow um, being kept in files and lofts and outhouses, old copies of rail news, um, old copies of uh, uh, computing magazines. It's it's a rich source, and it also gives you a a marvellous opportunity to ask damn full questions. Well, I do hope you've got a, a very big garage to store all these things in. <laughs> <laughs> um, Samantha, I think uh, you're next with a question. Yes, um, Jonathan, um, there's a question from anonymous attendee. It's quite an interesting one, actually. So he's saying, um, Prua IBM were supplying punch cards and systems to Deutsche Bahn during the Third Reich. To what extent did TOPS and the defence systems build on this early rail operate, operations programming? Um, well, the answer is there is an excellent book on punched cards by a Danish author who, uh, whose name escapes me that, that details IBM's operations in uh, Nazi Germany before the second, during the Second World War. There are a lot of myths surrounding it and IBM has perhaps been wrongly tarred with uh, too much complicity. The answer is that no, that punch cards have a long history of their own. As I mentioned, uh, the um, Langshire and Yorkshire Railway were the second organization after I think Wally Woolwich Dockyard to adopt punch cards in their own right for use in Hollerith machines, uh, which would count and develop basic accounts for, uh, for, for the Langshu and Yorkshire Railway. And these diffused incredibly quickly during the First World War. Bob Gwynn and I have done some fascinating work on the Hollerith archives at the University of, uh, of Manchester. So punch cards were very familiar technology long before that minnow called IBM ever got involved with computing. They were just a very convenient way of storing large amounts of information, uh, typically as the standard was on, 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 on 80 columns. Um, so uh, punch card technology was very familiar it, and it just happened to be a good, uh, a standard way of uh, storing and transferring information by the mid 1970s. But very soon uh, tops, uh, area freight centres began to develop um, VDUs, for example, for inputting data and the cards were discarded. Certainly uh, in my computer life, I remember mock terminals coming in in the late 1970s uh, and certainly uh, British Rail was throwing out cards and adopting visual display units by, by, the, um, uh, by the late 1970s. So actually those, those Ventec card readers uh, didn't last uh, that long. They, they did get in with things. But punch cards have a massive history quite separately from, from IBM. Uh, it is true that IBM were involved with punch cards before the Second World War, but they weren't even the, the, the leading pioneer. Thank you, Jonathan. And I'm going to uh, take uh, two questions, join them into uh, to one now. So, so one question is, did the cards, when you're putting a consist together, have to be in the same order uh, as the rolling stock forming the train? And the follow-on one well, to that is, um, was there any link in tops between the train consist and operational parameters like the required uh, locomotive power or weight limits on the route? Sure. Um, first things first, the cards always mimicked the train. So from what I remember, there was something like a start card. Um, well, actually, the first card will probably be the dial-up number for uh, Blamford House. 
because this was circuit switch. So you had to have a, effectively what amounted to a, a, a telephone number. It wasn't called a telephone number, but it, that, so that would be perhaps the first card. The second card would be a sort of start card. The third card then would be um, something, say the locomotive, and then the, then the wagons in sequence and it would end with the brake van and then an, an end card. From what I remember of looking at these, these decks it was some, some time ago. So the cards always mimicked the train. And of course, what you didn't want to do is to drop the deck of cards. Uh, those of us who remember computing in the 70s will remember the disaster of dropping a deck of cards, particularly if you fail to uh, put numbers on them in the, uh, in the comment column, for example. Uh, so that the the um, the, uh, the 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 whole central idea, as we saw from that second film, was that the the, the cards mimicked the the information in the file uh, 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 that would go straight through to Blanford House. Now Blanford House, essentially, I skipped over a great deal of the file handling, but there were five different sets of files because if you think about it, you have an interaction between the train itself, its movements along the track, the so-called operating timetables, the availability of the loco and the traction of the loco and its ability to pull that particular set of wagons. And, um, and so there are actually a whole set of interacting files. And the really clever thing about IBM, the IBM macro handling was that it was able to pick up all the necessary files interlink them so that yes you made sure that the the, the end the loco could pull the train uh, um, uh, interlink them and then spew out the resulting calculations and information where it was needed so it was really in many respects a massive exercise in file handling almost unprecedented for its day because after all they didn't have uh, memory storage what was it i said it was four megabytes or something um, they had all this had to be done by interrogating uh, files on disks. Thank you. Um, we have uh, a few questions uh, all surrounding. Basically, you mentioned that TOPS is is still alive in some form today, but presumably not a, an enormous room full of IBM four megabytes of memory mainframe servers. So, what what elements of TOPS are still used uh, in the current? current system? The answer is we've tried to unravel this. You could run TOPS now on part of your mobile phone whilst also playing a game. Um, what happened was that, that Blanford House became very valuable for property development. So as computer technology moved on and, and mainframes got more powerful and memory got larger and cheaper, British Rail moved the TOPS system to crew and that was quite a major exercise. And then they demolished Blanford House and sold it off for property development because the British Rail were quite shrewd when it came to things like that. Um, and at Crewe, it rapidly became integrated with all sorts of other pieces of software. So one of the things I have seen is an absurdly complicated diagram which relates tops to all other pieces of software for example, software relating to locomotive maintenance, relating to vehicle maintenance, to, to include passenger trains, to include scheduling of passenger trains, to include, and the list goes on. So what you have is this absurdly complicated uh, ecosystem of software with what amounts to the original uh, top system in there. And I was amused to read that even now the, the freight railway uses um, essentially the kernel that is tops, although it was rewritten. Uh, it was rewritten in a rather bizarre way. What happens was that tops spawned in the UK because IBM had a large UK operation, kicks this commercial interchange system with its uh, three forms of verification, which as I suggested is used throughout the financial system. You meet it, for instance, with, with, with bank cards. And that kick system then became a universal piece of software for all sorts of financial transactions. And they then just popped tops back into kicks. 
the funny thing is, and we cannot get to the bottom of this, and we would love some interview evidence, please. It has been said to us by one of the Kix developers that there is a lot of train jargon in the software and that quite a lot of the software underlying the banking system actually has train language in it. But we would we can't we have only got one interview which gives us detail on that. We would love some more information, please. Great, thank you. Jonathan, um, we've got a couple of questions around um, around about um, how t the massive change that TOPS brought about. Um, and do you have any indication of what the initial reaction was of the British Rail staff to the introduction of TOPS? Um, but obviously TOPS is still operating today. Um, and how many assets is it currently managing? And how does that compare to the original system? Gosh. <laughs> Well, the, the second part's much easier than the first because it's much more straightforward. Obviously, the assets have been slimmed down enormously. And nowadays, what we have are essentially um, each train consist is fairly permanent. The trains are permanently, effectively permanently coupled. You have uh, train only freight. You don't have wagon only freight. That's been abandoned, uh, although there were attempts to revive it. Uh, and so that's it's much simpler. It's a much smaller system, and and it's fragmented across different owners, and uh, uh, and so in in that respect, Tops is much smaller and much simpler. It presided over decline, uh, and uh, um, and did so by injecting much more efficiency as, as as the decline went on. As to its reception, this is fascinating, because there was a mixed reception. Some areas were greeted it very warmly. I mean, for example, you've heard about the clerks who got very considerable promotion and overtime opportunities. Um, other areas resisted. For example, there were major industrial relations problems in South Wales, and there is a vast archive in the National Archives of British Rail industrial relations deliberations, whereby essentially British Rail ran rings around the unions by dividing them up into different uh, uh, interest groups, the locomotive people, the signalmen, the shunters and so on. And, and they tended to leave Wales to its own devices. But otherwise the cutover was done on schedule and uh, it seemed to me remarkably effectively. The main concern, and this is where there is some doubt, is how closely people adhered to it. So there are, for example, audits saying, look, this is terrible. You've got, you know, 96 wagons in this yard. There's only 86 of them on tops. And what's more, they're not the same 86 as are in your yard, you know. But on the other hand, there are other accounts, uh, including one, for instance, I read recently from South Nottingham, which said that the compliance level was, was, was actually remarkably high. And I think that's probably the truth, that young graduate managers uh, took on uh, running tops with zeal. And, uh, and uh, of course, it was fairly straightforward for things like merry-go-round trains that were permanently coupled. So a mixed picture, but British Rail got there. At a time of industrial relations turmoil, they got there. They adopted it. Absolutely. It was delivered on schedule and on time. Remarkable. We could learn from that, couldn't we, today? <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. So I, I think we're, we're rapidly running out of time uh, with, with lots of questions coming in. Um, uh, I think Richard has got one uh, last one for you, Jonathan. And um, over to you, Richard. Yes, just a, a final one. Um, did any other European uh, nations uh, acquire or use TOPS? The answer is in America, Burlington Northern adopted it at much the same time as British Rail. Canadian National, we've heard, uh, switched their system to, to TOPS. Uh, British Rail actually had a team selling TOPS worldwide. They were, for example, in China when Tiananmen Square took place, which rather stymied their sales effort. Um, uh, the uh, various European railway systems uh, pursued their own developments and we would dearly love to know why the German kinetic island experiment failed. But no, everything goes quiet. People don't talk about uh, whole system wide software failures. And it's been extraordinarily difficult to get any information on what went wrong in Germany. But basically it failed. 
Thank you. So uh, I'd just like to, to thank uh, my, my three very uh, capable colleagues today, uh, Richard, Michael and Samantha, for uh, giving you a grilling, Jonathan. Um, I hope you didn't mind. Uh, no problem. We, we had uh, a, a quite a large number of questions today, and it, it seems to be a topic that um, the, uh, um, the audience knows quite a bit about, as you, you said. Um, so that's encouraging and uh, a, a very good uh, turnout of people today interested in your topic. So. Um, on behalf of the, the IT Surrey, I would like to, to really give you a, a very hearty uh, virtual uh, round of applause, as we can't do that um, in, in, uh, in person on, um, uh, on the medium today. So thank you very much for taking the trouble. Clearly, you've got, a, um, as a, perhaps all historians, an encyclopedic knowledge of, um, of, of the topic. And no doubt we could continue to, to dig into that. Um, uh, almost uh, endlessly and find new things um, that, uh, uh, that that would be interesting to know. So I, I think, um, uh, again, as with the, with most historians, the, the value you bring is condensing that into something which um, summarises that, uh, that great body of knowledge in a way that we can take something from and understand why things happened, how they happened and what would happen in the future. So thank you very much for Thank you for being such a patient audience. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, otherwise, uh, that's just about it from today's event. Uh, again, thank you to Jonathan for um, traveling nowhere at all from Manchester to join us. And uh, thank you to, to my uh, able assistants who've been very good on the questions. And in the background, uh, Colin has been organizing uh, the uh, activity and uh, Peter, Mobs also very kindly organised with Jonathan to get today's event uh, up and running. So uh, that's everything from us and uh, thank you very much for attending.